Good evening, good evening, good evening, whoever you are. God bless you, wherever you may be, at home, on the road, in some place where you can catch us live. We bring you greetings from Power, Hope, and Grace Bible Church. Now, oftentimes we say you are at a place where everybody is somebody. Jesus is the reason why. We are grateful and honored to be able to come to you live tonight, uh, getting it right, going back to the Bible, or as we say sometime, B-T-T-B, back to the Bible. So we trust and pray that others will come in and join us in our uh, open and live discussion as we look at the Word of God, see what the Scriptures say, talk and respond to uh, Bible subjects and questions that may come in. Uh, you that are tuning in, God bless you. If you need to take a quick moment and just remind somebody that we're on that may not know about us or that you had intended to tell about us, feel mm -hmm. free to take a moment and uh, contact them, text them, send them some kind of notice that we are on live. Mm -hmm. Perhaps they have a burning Bible question or something that they need answered from the scriptures. We will try our best with the help of God to respond to them. So we, uh, again, have the uh, fellas here tonight and uh, we are ready to go. So we're going to have prayer. We ask that you join us in a word of prayer. Lord God, in Jesus' name, thank you for this day. Thank you for this moment. Thank you for this opportunity to share with the live audience. Pray, God, that you give us strength, knowledge, and wisdom. Holy Spirit, work in us and through us. Bring back to our remembrance the things that are needed. Lord, let your word have free course in our hearts and minds. Let the scriptures, God, pour out and be radiant as we prepare to share with the audience. Lord, uh, lead us, guide us, and let questions be answered. Let souls be drawn to you. Saints be encouraged. Unbelievers, God, be dealt with. Go yes, with what they hear, that their heart will be touched, to confess their sins, that acknowledge you and repent, yes. and come to you for salvation. Let your will be done. Yes. Pray for the sick and the afflicted, that you would heal, deliver, and make whole. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, once again, God bless all of you that are listening and those that will listen down the road that will act, uh, uh, access this video and this teaching and this discussion by way of YouTube, uh, Facebook, or whatever way you can get it. Um, we are grateful to the Lord uh, for this Thursday. On this past weekend, we were in our Back to the Bible conference. We had a great time in the Lord, wonderful fellowship. Preach word of God, powerful discussions and panels. Mm. And we're just grateful and thank God for that. Uh, for all of you that uh, came uh, by the uh, local building and that joined us, for those that tuned in, those that watched us. We also encourage you, those that want to see what and hear what was talked about, you can go to our website. You can access uh, the conference by mm. way of our website. Uh, our Facebook page, and you can hear, uh, I believe, every word that was uttered mm -hmm. during this past weekend. We gathered on Saturday morning at 10 o'clock a.m., uh, so there's about two hours of content there. Then we regathered on Sunday morning at 11.15 a.m., and then Sunday afternoon at 3.30 mm -hmm. uh, Yours truly uh, ministered Sunday for our 11.15 service. And we were talking about um, three specific areas, and we basically covered one of them that are three main purposes of the church, why we come to church and why the church exists. If the Lord says the same and nothing happens, we plan to deal with uh, the second reason in more detail. Uh, mm -hmm. So you can come uh, this coming Sunday and be with us. Mm -hmm. And uh, last Sunday during our conference, Pastor Mike, he closed us out. Uh, in our conference and preach a very wonderful and powerful message uh, dealing with the church, the ecclesia, the importance of the church, the necessity of the church, and why we all should belong to a, a local church. Uh, mm -hmm. Many of those things was covered in that powerful, powerful message. Uh, on Saturday, back to Saturday, we had an uh, open time of questions. A question could come in from our social media audience and from the floor. There were a number of questions that was asked from the floor, and that means on site, and people that were here in the audience had an opportunity to ask questions. Then we also 
had some questions that we were able to get to that came in through uh, social media that was posted in our chat section. So we're going to deal with some of those questions uh, tonight. Now, we had shared with the audience then, brothers, that these questions come in and we can get to them all, that we'll try to respond tonight. Now, it was interesting that someone came to me after the session and they said, you all didn't get to my question. <laughs> I told them the time just ran out. So I believe they are watching tonight. So if you have your question, you can feel free to put it in our chat section section tonight. And if any of you that are watching and are listening, you have any Bible-related questions, go to our chat session section, post your question, put a Q or a question mark in front of it, and we will try to get to that question. But so we can be true to our word, I will read a couple questions that came in on this past Saturday, this past weekend, that we didn't have time to get to. And we're going, our brothers, we're going to get right into tackling those questions. And mm -hmm. here is one question, brothers, that says, um, it simply says, how can we pray better for the church worldwide? How can we pray better for the church worldwide? We were talking about the universal church, the invisible church, the visible church, the universal church, and the local church. And we know that as long as there is people, there are potential problems. Mm -hmm. What can the church do, those that are in the church do, to better pray? How can they better pray for the worldwide church or the, the church worldwide? Well, definitely. I think, uh, Bishop, that's a great question. I think that first and foremost, we realize, and I think you already hit on it, that uh, as long as we have people in the churches, there will be concerns. There can be some problems. <laughs> There can be some uh, issues that need addressing. Uh, however, I think first and foremost is acknowledging the fact that we all still live in a sinful world and that we still all need God. And I think if a person can realize that there may even be some issues in their own local church, then you ought to understand that there's going to be some issues uh, throughout the universal church. And so understanding that is important. And then recognizing and uh, having love and patience with one another as we work through those issues through and by the power of the Holy Spirit and, and have a heart to pray and help people. And that's really all of our jobs. You know, I was thinking uh, this week and actually coming up on the lesson as we're going through Gospel of John on Sundays mm -hmm. where Jesus himself <laughs> girds himself <laughs> with a, a sheet and gets down and washes the disciples feet. Mm -hmm. Right. So that kind of tells us that we're all servants of one another. And if Jesus could serve uh, at what was deemed at that time to be one of the lowest offices, how much more should we have the type of love toward one another that we're willing to be patient, to love on each other, oh God, minister to each other in any way that we can? So our heart should always be to pray, to intercede, that God would help each and every one of us as we overcome. All right. Okay. Pastor Charlie, anything you want to add to that? Yes. I mean, prayer is something that God has privied us with to uh, commune with him, to talk, you know, with him concerning the concerns that we have <laughs> and whatever it is that we see. And uh, that's a beautiful thing that we can pre uh, 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 pray to the uh, creator of all things. And uh, I thought about the very fact that when uh, we know the early church spent time coming together and praying together. And when prayer is set aside collectively or corporately, we need to come together. Mm -hmm. And we see that modeled in Acts chapter two. And then there's times when we have our own personal prayer moments, our own uh, private closet prayers that we go in and we petition mm -hmm. the Lord on the behalf of others and that would include interceding for others, so on and so forth. And when we really just simplify it, prayer is talking to God and waiting in God's presence. Take it to the Lord. He already knows what we need, but he wants us to participate so we can better do it by doing it perhaps more often. Mm -hmm. Okay, and be sincere and knowing that God does answer prayer. Go to God in faith. 
as we are, are, have been taught to go to God in faith, come together when it's time, have our own personal prayer and believe and trust God for the results. Mm -hmm. For those that may have just tuned in, thank both of you. Uh, the question centered around how can we pray better for the church worldwide? And uh, this is a command in the Bible for us to pray for one another. Uh, the Bible is very clear. And even when we read through the book of Acts, we see that the church was praying and they were praying for specific things. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they were praying for things that was happening right in that day and time and praying about those things. Mm -hmm. such as when the apostles were thrown in jail in Acts chapter number four. And then when their life was threatened, the church came together and prayed. In Acts 12, when Peter was in jail, the church came together and they prayed. So we pray for the church by learning the scriptures and praying what the Bible uh, encourages for the church to be doing. And if it's not, then we're to pray that the church would have an ear to hear, an ear to do, and a mind to do what God called them to do. So these are some of the ways that we pray. We pray that the word of God is preached and taught with clear and, and clarity and preciseness because mm -hmm. all churches that are God-fearing churches, that is what their job and responsibility is supposed to be. And we yes. know that the enemy fights against those things. So we pray. And in praying, we always have to keep in mind, don't think that your assembly is the only one right. <laughs> okay, there are other churches out there that are striving to do right and striving to do the will of God. So we pray that what? God's will be done. Jesus said, Father, not my will, but let thy will be done. So that's how we, that, that, those, these are some of the ways that we pray. We right. uh, intercede, pray that the word of God is preached. Pray that the saints have an ear to hear the word of God. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. Here's yes. another question that says, um, how much emphasis is, is placed on the church to tend to the practical needs of the members versus the spiritual need? How much emphasis should be placed on the church to tend to the practical needs of uh, the members versus the spiritual need? That's an interesting question. Mm -hmm. So whichever one of you want to tackle that first, jump right in. Go right ahead. <laughs> Uh, just, our audience, let me just say this, for those that are just tuning in, we just want you to keep in mind, these are questions that was left over from our Back to the Bible conference that we didn't get a chance to answer, and we said that we'll uh, respond today. So that's what we're doing. So these are questions that was previously turned in. Go ahead. Right. I mean, uh, I think uh, both are, are, are imp important, you know, when it comes to the people of God and and, you know, the spiritual as well as the natural, we see where, you know, Jesus didn't want, you know, folks to be hungry, so on and so forth. And we can see in Acts chapter six, you know, that there was things going on where the women, um, the Grecian women were being neglected, so on and so forth. And so they uh, came to their aid and rescue. But if we notice that passage, they asked the congregation, the people of God, to choose, you know, in particular men that would help in that area. Why? Mm -hmm. So the apostles could spend more time in the word. It wasn't about neglecting nothing, but it was about how the body comes together and try to meet all of the needs of the people. So the apostles had a responsibility, other parts of the church. Uh, the believers, they had a responsibility as well. But yes, most importantly, the spiritual aspect or, you know, the word aspect is 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 vitally uh, important. Uh, for the Bible, it says man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. So we do see that example, you know, and we know the early church had, you know, they sold their possessions and goods because they were so concerned about everybody having things in common. So we do see that picture of both concerns, but we know the spirit man really needs to be attended to, you know, because if you die of, of, of natural hunger, you need to die being born again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you, you will be all right. But both are important. Yes. All right. Yes. Um, I think and Pastor Charlie hit on it. You know, certainly we see in the Bible that the church certainly 
uh, was concerned about the natural needs. You know, uh, they sold many in the early church. They sold their possessions and goods, laid it at the apostles' feet. They distributed it to everyone as they had need. Uh, you see them feeding the widows. You see the apostle Paul said that he was commissioned by the Lord to do good to the poor. Mm -hmm. uh, so certainly the church is very interested, not just in the spiritual man, but in the whole man, which includes uh, natural. As Pastor Charlie says, certainly we want to put major emphasis on the spiritual side as well. But one thing that I, I like to uh, think about, because sometimes people say, well, what is the church doing? Well, if you understand, the commission is for all of us. Right. I don't I don't need to figure out whether the church has a program if I see my brother hungry and I can help him. Right. So, and I think that if we all have that care, love and passion, concern for one another, then there'll be less needs as well. I don't have to say, well, call the church and see if they got a program when I know I can when I know I can reach out my hand. The Bible says if you see your brother in need and shut up the bowels of your compassion, how dwells the love of God in you? So we all make up the church. And if that love is in the church, uh, having love uh, in in, in uh, service one toward another, then mm -hmm. I think that that is really the biblical picture of what the Bible is talking about. Not necessarily for us to have 20 programs. We've got a whole bunch of people who need to be loving on one another and making sure we all have our needs met. All right. Okay, good. And again, for uh, if there's anyone that is just tuned in, this question says how much emphasis is placed on, should be placed on the church to tend to the practical needs of the members versus the spiritual need. Well, and, you know, we have examples in the Bible and even Jesus himself taught uh, concerning uh, the Jewish nation in Matthew chapter 25 about feeding, clothing, uh, mm -hmm. visiting and things of that nature. Uh, those who are in prison, he said that when you do it to the least of these, my brother, you have done it unto me. So right. practical needs are important, but there is nothing that supersedes and goes above and beyond the spiritual need. Mm -hmm. As Pastor Charlie drew a picture in his illustration of saying it's better to, um, if, if a person is going to leave here, it's better for them to be spiritually intact and lacking with practical needs than versus spiritual needs. Because if the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwell in us by way of yeah. the Holy Spirit, the father that raised up Christ from the dead will also quicken our mortal bodies or give us life and change our body. So, yes, we do what we can. But uh, it is not the church's job. See, one of the in spiritual needs, spiritual needs that if churches are involved in that, that's going to help them teach a person how to handle practical needs. Mm -hmm. So we want you to keep that in mind as well. So that's why the emphasis must be placed spiritually. And then we do what we can naturally. All yes. right. Uh, here's a third question. Then we'll go to our screen after this question. Mm -hmm. uh, this question says, uh, how do you respond to musicians? who plays and they get paid for churches with either false teaching or false doctrine, but they claim they are only there to do a job and not the, uh, and not the teachings. I'll read it again. How do you respond to musicians who play at various churches and they get paid, but these churches are false, have false teachings and false doctrine, but the musician who's getting paid claim that they are only there to do a job and not uh, for the teachings. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll just say this. Uh, go, go ahead, Pastor Mike. I'm, 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 I'm gonna defer to you, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> uh, I think at the end of the day, everybody gonna have to see God. Uh, uh, and I think that what we have to realize is how you know, how dangerous false doctrine is. And sometimes we're people, we take false doctrine lightly. Uh, me personally, uh, I couldn't work at an abortion clinic, mm -hmm. right? Stating that I just work it, got to get a job, right? Because I realize what's being committed in those clinics uh, is a egreg egregious act uh, and a very sinful act. And if I take that same mentality, I personally couldn't work uh, at a place that is uh, dispensing out heretical false doctrine. We're not talking about secondary we're talking about flat out heresy or false doctrine. I couldn't because I realized, as Paul said about uh, Hymenaeus and Philetus, he said their words spread like cancer. So that 
Cancer is a very serious and dangerous disease. And Paul put that heresy that these men were teaching on the same level of this death uh, coming disease. And so in, in that light, me personally, again, everybody don't have to see God for their own decisions. But I think that if we put it in the light of scriptures and realize that I don't want to be a part of anything that's going to destroy anybody spiritually. And I don't I don't want to be providing the entertainment for a place where people are being sent to hell. And that's just me. Right. <clears throat> yeah, I think that is a very interesting question because uh, sometimes the church may allow things to go on and the Bible may not directly say something about it, but sometimes it can cause more problems than help. Mm -hmm. Now, I know what some musicians would say, well, it's just a job. But when it comes to the church, and again, all this last weekend, we were talking about the importance of the church, defining the church according to the Bible. Uh, I think we have to be very, very careful here. Because notice, we're talking about the church. We're not just talking about Chrysler, GM, Ford, or said corporation. Right. We're talking about the church. Mm -hmm. So I'm hired by a church that's teaching false doctrine but I'm playing music. The purpose of playing music is for praise and worship. And I think sometimes we may not fully think about this. Mm -hmm. So I call myself using my instrument to praise and worship God, but hearing this false teaching every week, that can be a bit problematic. I would, as you all stated, I would, you should really pray about that. You know, there are other jobs that a person can do it's like Pastor Mike said, working at an abortion clinic. I couldn't do it either. I couldn't work at a bar and be a bartender. Right. I would have to trust God. Okay, God, I don't want to do this because I feel it will have an impact on me glorifying you through the fruit of my life. So open up a door, you know. Uh, you can mm -hmm. talk to the people that come out the bar all day. <laughs> Let them come out, <laughs> out of the bar. So I think it's problematic, but this is something that the church have created. There are a lot of musicians. And then the other part, and this is the dangerous part, that many musicians seem to not even care. Yes. He says that, that I'm working and some of them are not members of any church. They just go, they play, get paid, and then go to the next gig. That's problematic because part of the reason of the church is for people to assemble together to hear the word of God. And you're sitting under false teaching, mm. that's serious. That's a problem. Right. And that person really needs to pray, deal with their conscience, and deal with the leading of the Holy Spirit. And Bishop, may I just add, mm -hmm. it's a possibility that the, the false leader is using this individual. Wow. Because we know how powerful music can be. Yeah. And so don't don't let yourself be used to promote and propagate something that's anti-God or anti-Christ. And if you know what the true church looks like, you should be playing in a true church. And my advice to musicians as a whole, you know, that should not perhaps be your, your career. Mm -hmm. That's part of your gift and talent. You probably should seek employment and if you get a blessing amen but i don't mm -hmm. I, I think that's kind of where we kind of may have missed it by not educating and promoting the fact that you know if this is your home church mm -hmm. you, know, you should support your home church yeah. you don't necessarily have to get paid now if they decide to give you some amen but to, to make that your first and, and foremost occupation you know we need to talk about that too you know and just we need to have a conversation. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, the church in many cases have just gone too far with this uh, music stuff. Everybody want to get paid right. and things of that nature. Uh, you know, I, I think, I mean, you know, there's there's this, you know, in the sense of the term, I don't mean to be negative, but there's this monster that have been created and it's hard to pull back because, you know, people a lot of times come to church for the music over the word. And that's a problem. Come to church for the singing that's over the word. Right. And that's not how it is to be defined according to the Bible. Mm -hmm. And I know, I mean, you know, there, I don't know who is listening to us, but I'm sure there's some pastors out there 
and they probably have musicians that they hired. I'm just saying, the Bible teaches us to know them that labor among us. So mm -hmm. some of these musicians, how saved are they? When musicians can leave from playing the organ and the drums and go in the parking lot and smoke marijuana, Ooh. that's a problem. Or Ooh. they're biblically, you know, don't have, uh, you know, deep biblical uh, convictions or know the word. Right. Remember, right. and I said it on this past week, and I'll continue to minister it down the road that the one of the top reasons that the church gather outside of exalting God is to hear the word of God. Mm -hmm. So we need to take that into consideration. Much more we could say, but I hope that helped. Uh, Pastor, mm -hmm. we can go to our screen and see what's up there. I know there's a few questions there. Yes, sir. I think there was even a question before that. Was it? Uh, yeah, I think so. I think I saw something they had question in front of. But if not, we will take this one. Okay. While we're looking, mm -hmm. it says where. Uh, it says where in the. Uh, oh my goodness! Got to get. I got to get my glasses right. <laughs> it says where is the biblical medium between having faith and waiting on God versus not doing enough in our own power to achieve whatever the goal is? It's a, a good question, a very interesting question. My first response would be that the Bible uh, is clear that we are to pray about everything. Right. But remember, faith without works is dead, number one. Then faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. If I want to go shopping and uh, buy some groceries and I have $50, I can go get some milk and bread. Mm -hmm. I don't need faith to go do that. If you understand what I'm saying, I'm using an analogy here. Uh, I don't need faith to do that. God have already blessed me. So I thank him for that. Now I have to get up and go shopping and not say the milk and bread is just going to come to me. It's just going to float through the air and come to me. Mm -hmm. The Bible teaches us whatever your hands find to do, do it with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. So we should reasonably do what it is. For instance, if I want to be a school teacher, I need to go and learn about being a school teacher, what it takes. Mm -hmm. Get a certificate or working under somebody else's certificate. You know, it's all legit. So I do what I can do yet waiting on God. Now, we don't want to get into anything extreme or extravagant or outlandish. Mm -hmm. We have to be reasonable in our thinking. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, like you said, <laughs> and this came up and I've heard it before, but somebody was just saying, somebody was calling themselves having faith. That, I don't know, it may have been you, Pastor Mike, and saying, you know, well, who, whoever it was, yeah, I'm going to go buy this car, you know, and, uh, you know, I done prayed about it and claimed that then they have no money at all. <laughs> We're going to the dealership. No, stop it. Stop it. You need to have a down payment. You need to have some money. You need to have your credit ran. Now, if God chooses to do something miraculous in that, so be it. But do what you can within reason and trust right. God for the rest. Brothers? Right. Well, Go ahead, Pastor. Mm -hmm. Well, I like what you just said too, Bishop. That was powerful because, uh, like you indicated, faith without works is dead. And I like what you how you ended that that with do what you can within reason. Yes. Because sometimes where we show a lack of faith is when we start being compromising godly principles mm -hmm. in order to accomplish that purpose. Uh, I personally don't think God wants you not be, not to be able to come to church <laughs> you know <Yep. laughs> and, you know like man I, I just got to get these three jobs just for a while just to get it done i got to make it happen <laughs> right and you now you, you're, you're getting less word uh, less fellowship with the saints your prayer mm -hmm. life is hindered because you're always tired and all these things so those can be indicators that wait a minute maybe i am taking too much upon myself and not right. relying on god but what mm -hmm. you can do within reason always keeping your spiritual life at the top uh that's a part of our faith yeah that's good i just thought of the scripture i just wanted to make mention seek ye first hmm. kingdom of god and all his righteousness and all of these things will be added unto you mm -hmm. bottom line is the the how we can 
uh, allow this to work itself out is keep God first at all times. Mm -hmm. Trust God and his ways. And even when you start pursuing things, you still need to be <laughs> communicating and in tune with the Lord because you might have to get off of those tracks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I'm he may change your direction. And so it's always about keeping him in his rightful place. And so things will work out like that. Always stay open to what God is doing and what God is saying on whatever your journey is, whatever your pursuit is, acknowledge the Lord first, seek him first, keep him in his rightful place. Of course, that would be Matthew chapter six, uh, verse uh, 33 and on. Um, mm -hmm. And just like you said, just to say this is that uh, sometimes any of us, if we don't be careful, we can get caught up in trying to figure out how God is going to work out things, yes. how God is going to do things, and perhaps can lose patience because it may not seem like God is moving fast. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. God's timing is always right. Right. We have to trust him with godly wisdom. And then we have to work. If a man don't work, he don't eat. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Where we at? Here's a question that says, can you explain John 8, 56? What exactly did God show Abraham concerning Christ? All right. Okay, get into a little theology here. Mm -hmm. St. John 8, 56. Your father Abraham rejoiced, Jesus says, to see my day. And he saw it and was glad. So the question said, what did Abraham see? Well, in that the Bible uh, interprets itself, there's two things we can do, and we can do it in either way. We can either go left from this passage <laughs> back to Genesis, or we can go right to the book of Hebrews. <laughs> mm -hmm. If we go left in Genesis chapter 12 and chapter 15 and chapter 17, I bet 15, what God does is he makes a promise to Abraham. Right. He tells Abraham that from his seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Mm -hmm. And that promised seed ultimately was through uh, Isaac and Jacob. That would be the Messiah. And what this passage is letting us know when Jesus makes this statement that Abraham was a father of faith. Mm -hmm. According to Hebrews chapter number 11, it says this in regards to Abraham, that mm -hmm. Abraham embraced the promises of far off. So what Abraham saw through faith, now, however else God did it, God could have done it, have given him a vision of the future. The Bible just doesn't say. But we know that through faith, Abraham embraced that promise, knowing that God was a faithful God mm -hmm. and that God would bring that seed, which is Christ. God would bring it to pass. It would come through the loins of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. So. Again, the Bible doesn't go into detail. It tells all what Abraham saw. God showed him a vision of the future or whatever. But we know through faith, the evidence of things not seen, mm -hmm. through faith, Abraham was able to embrace those promises. And God let Abraham be assured of that. So mm -hmm. that is uh, the best that I can respond to that question. Brothers, feel free. Just to add on to that. I thought about uh, Abraham and the episode with his son, Isaac. You know, I think that was a telltale sign of something uh, futuristic as well that mm -hmm. tied into the interconnectedness with the promise of whatnot, that there would be this one that would come out of his seed, that the entire world would be blessed. Mm -hmm. And we see how God kind of demonstrated that with that episode with uh abraham taking isaac up on uh mount moriah i believe that's genesis chapter 22. so that's another way of if we go left <laughs> <laughs> all right so he saw it through isaac and isaac was a type of christ right i have no mm -hmm. problem with that discussion yes sir I, and um and i i've heard the what pastor charlie said as well and i think I think there certainly could be some relevance to that in that he said through his seed, all the nations would be blessed mm -hmm. and how, you know, God used Abraham and Sarah through their faith to, to bring about Isaac. Uh, at the end of the day, the scripture isn't spe clearly specific as to what 
all the details of what he saw. Mm -hmm. uh, and so where where we stop at is where the scriptures stop. <laughs> mm -hmm. And but what we do know is Abraham rejoiced to see his day. And so some in some way, Abraham, who the Hebrew writer said, if you go, uh, is that right? <laughs> yeah. 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 That's right. <laughs> he embraced the promises of far off mm -hmm. and so uh, as well as some of the other uh heroes of the faith in hebrews chapter number 11 you know they were able to visualize the coming of jesus christ from afar and embrace those promises in their day as if they had already taken place so right. i think that's something we can hold on to so he embraced them afar off, and the Hebrew writer said, and was assured. Yes. Was assured that it would come to pass. All mm -hmm. right. So we hope that helped you. Mm -hmm. All right. Here's a question that says, uh, how would you describe the biblical repentance? How would you describe biblical repentance? Well, when we look at that word repent, that word repent has reference to a turning away from turning towards with a contrite heart or spirit mm -hmm. and that is recognizing being godly sorrow and uh turning to god for what he does no one can save themselves no one can bestow grace upon themselves you know we can't even love god without recognizing that god first loved us so repentance is a turning away from wrong the world the enemy and self and turning towards god that's biblical repentance. And it's something that God works in, in, in the individual as well. So there's mm -hmm. much more can be said, but I'll turn it over to my brothers. Yeah, I think we see biblical repentance as pastor uh, brought out as well. You know, uh, repentance should bring about some type of change. It's one thing for a person to say that they're sorry or to mm -hmm. say that they didn't mean to do it. But uh, it's another thing that when that person recognizes what they've done and you see fruit that follows what they say and mm -hmm. again so i think biblical repentance uh will always uh turn itself or lend itself to a person actually leaving the thing that they've repented from growing from it and moving on towards perfection all right very good right. very good the scripture comes to mind uh uh acts three when it talks about uh, repent, therefore, and be converted, mm -hmm. that change, that turning away so you can be converted, mm -hmm. <laughs> change, turn away, mm -hmm. yeah, and that you may be converted, that you uh, that your sins may be blotted out so that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. So, yes, mm -hmm. it's an actual turning away and it's an acknowledgement, you know, it's, it's getting down to the to the bare minimum. Mm -hmm. God, I need help. <laughs> I'm coming to you. Absolutely. I tried to fix it and it's still broke. <laughs> mm -hmm. You can fix it. Yes. Mm -hmm. And again, the uh, the fruit is then uh, produced in as far as what um, a person does, their lifestyle, their change. And as someone was just talking on Sunday and just in passing, uh, not Sunday, just uh, yesterday, Tuesday. I mean, well, Actually, yesterday was Wednesday, and it was Wednesday when this happened. Ran mm -hmm. into a woman, and she was just talking about, we're talking about the goodness of the Lord, and she was just saying how uh, it's no goodness of our own. It's not her that's doing it. It's the Christ that's working in us. And that's what true biblical repentance is. It's Christ working in us, the hope of glory. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. Hope that helped. Um, here's another uh, question before we get back to the screen sure. on our uh, uh, page here, paper. It says, uh, what's the difference between prayer language and tongues and what role do they play in the church what's the difference between prayer language and tongues and what role do they play in the church y'all see everybody getting quiet <laughs> that's generally the signal they waiting on me <laughs> I sure know got a response. But... <laughs> well, here it is. When we talk about prayer language, uh, you you know you won't directly see that term in the Bible. I know what people are saying. You know, if you pray and you know pray in the spirit and things of that nature, but prayer language, your prayer language 
can be in any language that a person speaks. I'm saying that to say this is because some have uh, given into this teaching or thought that your prayer language is speaking in tongues. And many Pentecostals, Pentecostals, Charismatic, they hold to that. Apostolics, some apostolics hold to that as well. Mm-hmm. That when I pray, I speak English, but when I pray in a prayer language, I'm speaking in, in tongues or other languages. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, there's nowhere in the Bible where that's actually taught that that's the only way right. that a person can pray in another language. So a prayer language is simply what Pastor Charlie said earlier, our communion with God. Mm-hmm. That's our prayer language. You can pray English. You can pray silently. <laughs> that's your <laughs> prayer language at that moment. Mm-hmm. When it comes to tongues, uh, the Bible is very clear to me. Tongues means languages. Mm-hmm. There are some people, because this has been fought against, have acquiesced to this thinking that tongues can be basically gibberish speech. And that right. is part of what makes it unknown. But that's a major stretch. But you hear, I mean, even supposedly scholarly charismatics that yield to that thought. There's nothing in the Bible that says anybody ever have to pray in tongues. And then that the Bible doesn't say it. We can't preach it and teach it and be right. right. This is a, can be a loaded question, but I digress since my brothers put me on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> no, you did, you did well, Bishop. But I wouldn't have, it wouldn't have came out like that for me. You know, <laughs> <I was so laughs> <seasoned. laughs> Right, right. <laughs> so yeah. I think you, you don't want to say anything either, Pastor Mike. You want to move on? No, we can move on. <laughs> yeah, <okay. laughs> It says here, uh, and this is uh, the, my, my last question, and we'll get back to our screen. Mm-hmm. What would you say to someone who's a new Christian, but they struggle with believing the Bible? What would you say to someone who is a new Christian, but they struggle with believing the Bible? Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's well, a lot of questions. I, I, I'll let you, I, I would simply say, uh, uh, welcome to being a new Christian. Yeah. <laughs> All of us have struggled with something the Bible said, simply because we just didn't know. Mm-hmm. Right? But the encouraging part is to stick with it. Right. Get under a sound Bible believing church and good teaching and grow in the knowledge and wisdom of Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. Right. And I'll just try to uh, help a person like that with a question like that to, to, uh, to understand how the Bible is put together as well. And so we need to learn the Bible and how, in particular, the New Testament, you know, we have the quote unquote biography, so to speak, of Jesus Christ. And then we have the letters of Paul, which teaches us how to live, you know, as Christians and why that's why that's important. And then let them know that that takes time as well. It's a process. And I I use Mm -hmm. the term often in talking to people. Rome was not built overnight. It's a process. And then we can get into sanctification. We can get to talking about a, a, a whole gamut of things to try to get them to understand that uh, you, you you need the Bible so you can learn more about what you have just, you know, encountered and why those things are important because you need to live out your faith at this point. And the only way you're going to know, you have to be familiar with the Bible. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I I like the question that says a new believer, mm-hmm. right? So so that tells me if they are genuinely a new believer, then they already have accepted Christ. There you go. Who mm-hmm. The scriptures talk about they've already accepted Christ dying, who the scriptures declare, and him being buried and resurrected. Mm-hmm. So that's great. So now starting from there, we can go left and right because we trace Christ all throughout all the scriptures. How from Genesis chapter three, he talks about the seed of the woman bruising the head of the serpent. And then the rest of the scriptures, all of them are going to point to Christ. So with their faith in Christ, as Bishop already brought out, to get into a sound biblical church where you can now learn those books, learn what the context of them are, and they'll find out that, wow, just as Christ is true in my life, so are all these books that testify about him. 
Amen. It's a learning process. Right. I usually illustrate something I like going to school. You graduate kindergarten to first grade, first grade to second grade. You mm -hmm. don't learn at all you right. know, overnight. So it's, it has to be a consistent pattern. Mm -hmm. Okay, back to our screen. Mm -hmm. uh, God bless you. It says, uh, was natural Israelites ever called Gentiles? Well, I guess in a sense, everybody was considered as a Gentile or detached from God before Abraham crossed the Euphrates River and God called him a Hebrew and then blessed his seed who became the Hebrews or the Jewish nation. All right, brothers. <laughs> yeah, this is actually a good friend, Minister Joseph Mallory. He's mm -hmm. a minister of uh, Pastor Peach's church. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> but uh, I think I know where this question is coming from because okay. the uh, Hebrew Israelites, they claim that the Gentiles in the New Testament are actually the northern tribe of Israel. Mm -hmm. And what they claim is, is that when God, quote unquote, divorced her and they were scattered in Israel. And when they were scattered and many times they denounced their, uh, you know, uh, law practices, dis discontinued being circumcised and keeping the law of Moses, that they, in essence, were the Gentiles then. And mm. so they lie, <laughs> the Hebrew Israelites, that is, they mm. lie and say that when Paul is referring to the Gentiles getting salvation, those are the true Israelites and not the other Gentile. So the, the answer to the question is uh, they were Israel themselves, as Bishop said, of course, mm -hmm. prior to Abraham and the covenant. But even though Israel was scattered ab abroad, Israel was still Israel. Which is right, why wherever God, they were at. <laughs> exactly. Which is why God still had promises to restore her mm -hmm. because she remained who she was. Right. So so that that is important to understand. And so I, that's all. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. And mm -hmm. thanks for the question, too, my brother. I hope that helped you. Mm -hmm. All right. Here's a question that says uh, in Ephesians four and eight. Who is the host of captives? All right. <laughs> mm -hmm. Ephesians 4. He that ascended. Who is he also? But he that descended into the lower mm -hmm. part. Hebrews 4, uh, verse number 8. It says this. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to Men, he, personal pronoun, mm -hmm. that's talking about Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. The host of captives was whoever was captive. <laughs> 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 now, I say that, that the speculation is this, and it, it's, it's controversial or, or with some because some just don't know. Some hold that this was when uh, paradise uh, changed the locations. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and anyone that was captive in the underworld of paradise was now led up to heaven. Is that possible? Sure, it's possible. But um, I can get into other speculation, but I won't. Mm -hmm. And again, the Bible is limited on sharing with us who and or what and what that uh, is. But... Um, it could be that if paradise was in a lower region, that after Christ's resurrection, you know, we have an example that when Jesus was dying on the cross, graves were open. And after his resurrection, saints got up and walked around Jerusalem. At some point in time, they left again, you know, so you that don't believe in a rapture, perhaps that may help you. They may have been raptured and carried up to heaven. I don't know. I'm just saying that. That's food for thought. <laughs> Brothers, you all can jump right in on that one if you want. <laughs> all right. That's 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 good with me. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> y'all a mess. Y'all something else. Oh my goodness. So uh yeah, you know, uh, again, there's just some things the Bible doesn't go into extensive detail about. So mm -hmm. what can we do? We can fish around all day. Mm -hmm. And that's why we make statements at times like this possibly could have been, mm -hmm. you know, we do know when Jesus tells a parable about the rich man and Lazarus, 
that there was a chasm or a gulf or separation, but all mm -hmm. of that seemed to have been in the underworld some kind of way. Mm -hmm. the rich man goes to paradise. I mean, the, the hell, and the beggar, you know, went to Abraham's bosom. Right. So maybe paradise has been elevated after Jesus's resurrection. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Let's go to our screen. It says, uh, "Do you think that uh, the Abraham uh, have any of the?" Writings of Moses, for example, Genesis three fifteen. Well, uh, in that culture, one of the ways there was two ways that things were passed down, either through writings and or carvings, and oral tradition. So, the, if the question is, is it possible? Absolutely, it's it, it's possible that uh, uh, um, Moses. Uh, had the writings of uh, Abraham. Be, see, well, if I'm understanding the question correctly, let me let me let me back up. Do you think that Abraham have any of the writings of Moses? Now Moses comes after Abraham. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's why I wanted to back up you know, to get clarity. Sometimes we can run ninety down the road <laughs> right. Uh, right in the middle. I say, wait a minute, let me read that question again. <laughs> mm -hmm. So Moses comes after Abraham. What we do know is this, is that they both knew the same God, yeah. which was the one and true living God. So the one true and living God, what he decided to reveal to Abraham, that was God's business. And what we do know is that Moses gained some type of insight in regards to that through the revelation of God. Mm -hmm. so I'll leave it at that. Yeah, just to add, just on to that, um, it is pl plausible, possible that, you know, God revealed something to Abraham. And this will go back to the question earlier, mm -hmm. you know, about what, uh, you know, Abraham saw or what Abraham knew. You know, we just don't know because the scripture just doesn't tell us. But he do know that there would be a promised seed that would be a blessing to the entire uh, world. So. If God broke all that down, he broke it down to Moses. Mm -hmm. so, and like you mm -hmm. said, same, same God, he could have very well have told him, but we just don't have nothing concrete to say that. So, yeah, all right. we keep moving. Hey, Amen. I mean, I concur with both. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, 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 I had to get that switch of my roof. <laughs> <laughs> Moses come after Abraham. All right, what do we have? Uh, it says, can you explain the difference between God asking Abraham to sacrifice Isaac and the people who sacrifice the children uh, to false God? Uh, sure, uh, Isaac didn't die, but those that offered the false gods, <laughs> they died. That's that's mm. that's the difference. And one mm. was pagan, and God was just testing Abraham. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, masters. <laughs> Abraham comes, and you know, some believe, and I I lean towards this as well. That Abraham, you know, being from a pagan nation himself, uh, it was uh, customary within those pagan cultures to offer up their children. Mm -hmm. And so, this, as Bishop said, was a testing of Abraham's faith. But then at the same time, by God not allowing Abraham to slay Isaac, God was showing that he is not like these other pagan deities. There you go. And so he's not requesting that we offer up our children because ultimately what Isaac pointed to was the fact that God would offer up his son. Mm -hmm. All right. Nothing uh, need to be said on that. Yeah. <laughs> You know, just that, uh, and a lot of times we people forget, even we sometime in the church, not maliciously, but forget that Abraham was from a pagan background. Right. That was his upbringing. That was his lifestyle. Yes. But uh, yeah, but he 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 learned through the conscience, the voice of God. However, God dealt with Abraham. He learned mm -hmm. there was a greater power. Yes, sir. All right, where we at? It mm -hmm. Says uh, so. <laughs> and knowing that family and friends are literally against me, am I wrong to just block them out of my life altogether? <laughs> well, the answer could be yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm saying it like that to say this, that sometimes we do have to withdraw ourselves from negative people. 
Jesus said that it could come a time where you had to forsake all to follow me. Mm -hmm. So if there's anybody that's trying to stop you from following Jesus, sometimes you may have to make a distinction uh, for a time, you know, a period of time. And, you know, each situation is different. Right. The second thing is this. We have to, and I'm speaking in general, not to the, the, the question, uh, uh, but in general, we have to learn to eliminate negative from yeah. our life. Sometimes we just surround with so much negativism. People talking negative, you know, nobody have nothing positive to say. And we need to spend time with God, get in God's mm -hmm. word and get in, in God's presence. Mm -hmm. and that can be a great help because people sometimes can be a, a distraction. Right. So we want to be very careful. But the other thing we want to be careful about is just getting so frustrated when we do that, cut everybody off. Now who are we going to witness to? Mm. So we have to really be prayerful and sensitive to the move of the spirit and God's word. So I just want to kind of park right there for now. Mm -hmm. Brothers, feel free. And that address was Matthew 10 concerning mm -hmm. forsaking. Uh, it may come a time that you have to forsake all. Right. All right. Mm -hmm. Or, yeah, but if it means if it's detrimental or if it's something that will put you in harm's way or anything or or to cause you to uh, denounce Jesus Christ, shut them off, shut them down, stay away, close mm -hmm. them off, whatever you got to do. Yeah, because you got to have that like we we used to say, Bishop, and I don't hear it too much anymore. For God, I live. <laughs> For God, mm -hmm. I live. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, that's how yeah. to be. A determining factor. Don't let nobody stop you from uh, having that right relationship with the Lord Jesus mm -hmm. Christ. If that's the case. Cut them off. Amen. If the Hebrew Israelite sent them to Pastor Mike's channel, <laughs> <go ahead. laughs> uh, yes. Oh, that was all good. I would just add that you know, as you may have to separate yourself from some, still continue to pray for them. Yeah. You know, because God could be preparing you to be that light that would help them mm -hmm. and draw them in. All Joseph's brothers was against him too. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> End up selling him. So he was apart from them for a while, but he actually became the one who actually God used to preserve that whole nation. So mm -hmm. God could be preparing you to be the one to, to help lead them to Christ. And they, uh, she also said in the second part of the question, or should they be handled with a long handle spoon, you know, okay. and that's a figure of speech, which means sometimes we do, we have to pick and choose, mm -hmm. uh, you know, even with family, sometimes, you know, as much as we love family, want to be around family, sometimes we do have to pick and choose how far we go. So mm -hmm. that's something you have to be prayerful about. And I like what uh, you said too, Pastor Mike, pray for them. Mm -hmm. That's our job, intercede mm -hmm. for them. Yes. Okay. Hope that helped you, dear. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think this is a question here. All right. Yeah. That's oh, for you. Oh, Pastor. it's the same. <laughs> oh, well, we answered this one. And okay. long story short, this is the one about uh, this is the one about whether whether or not uh, Israelites were called Gentiles. Got gotcha. you, <laughs> Minister Mallory. Uh, again, and I'll just summarize it just briefly here, just to say that uh, in essence. Uh, no, although God had, they had broken fellowship with God, they remained Israelites yes. <laughs> wherever they were. Even Absolutely. when they forsook the customs, they mm -hmm. remained Israelites. So when Hebrew Israelites try to say that the Gentiles in the New Testament are uh, Israelites, they are wrong. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> God bless you, Dr. Miller. Blast from the past. <laughs> Love you, man. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah, we need to hook up, Doc, and catch up. <laughs> All right. Okay. Where are we at? I think that was okay. it. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's my old time friend. <laughs> we called him the singing preacher. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, he's a little older now. I don't. I don't think he's still preaching. I don't know if he's still singing or he's still doing both of them. <laughs> it's all right. Here is a question, uh, brothers, that says, um, "Well, and I think we actually hit on this one last week, but it was still forwarded to me." It says, "What should someone do if they feel they are called to full time ministry?" So I think that was responded to last week, if I'm not mistaken. 
Yes. And one of the oh, things yeah. that we stress is that that is part of the importance of being a part of a local church as well, because now you have elders. See, in any thriving church, it should get to the point where they have perhaps a plurality of elders mm -hmm. that you can be accountable to and that can help minister and pour into your life and pray with you and pray for you. You know, the early church was big on ordination. It was big on laying hands on those that may have been called to certain ministries. Mm -hmm. And then um, and then the, the home church, that, that's the testing ground, too. Right. And, you know, especially, you know, and really whatever part of leadership a person has been called to, the mm -hmm. fruit should be seen yes. by the church. And, and we we're not necessarily saying every single iota member, but overall, yeah. the church should be able to recognize that ministry. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So they're coming in, Doc. As they, what do we have? <laughs> I, I don't see another question. Okay. But I was just going to say, Bishop, that confirmation okay. is important. Yeah. There you go. There confirmation you go. because one of the qualifications is to have a good reputation. There, <laughs> there you go. So when people can confirm, uh, your ministry, that, that's all the, the more. You know, Timothy right. had a good reputation amongst the church. Go. Right. And, and I, I think I, that's so important. Go ahead. Yeah, and I just want to add one thing. And if your pastor says, don't go, yeah. <laughs> mm. <laughs> you need to, and you got you you in the right kind of church. Don't go. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Kikoa says she went light tonight. Yes, <laughs> she did. You're good, and you were on time too. Mm -hmm. Okay, God bless all of you, everybody that tuned in. Oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so yeah, this, this is good. I would encourage uh, that uh, Yvette, mm -hmm. you know, I would encourage you to call the church office uh, tomorrow after nine and uh, it'll be seeing what may can be done. As you'll see the number on the screen as 313-895-7464. They may be able to at least direct you. So feel free to call the church uh, tomorrow. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> you see, you see that last one that came in, the brothers at 803 said was Judas saved. There's <laughs> <laughs> a question I had to answer, just wanted to get y'all take. <laughs> was Judas saved? That's <laughs> Mike, was Judas saying? <laughs> no. That's <laughs> Charlie, was Judas saying? And then he asked it at 802. Right, right. <laughs> yes, and God bless all of you tonight. We do want to welcome you here to Power, Hope, and Grace, uh, 6495 West Warren, located right in the city of Detroit. Every Sunday now, with the help of the Lord, we have Christian education at 10 o'clock a.m. And then 11, 15 a.m. is our morning worship service. Mm -hmm. uh, we are live in-house. You can come on by and share with us and be with us uh, just for a time of prayer, praise, and uh, presenting of God's word. Christian education, we have Bible topics, themes, and subjects that we're talking about. It's a time of interaction where you can reach out to uh, and bring your sense and your discussion to the class. And we have teachers that I'd be more than happy to be a blessing to you and help you uh, in every way that we can. To our congregation, let us remember upcoming events. Um, we have, uh, for instance, communion service, which is the fourth Sunday of April. And then the first Sunday of May, uh, we have a special service in honor of the late Deacon Charles Pickett. We're having service, but we'll be uh, dedicating a gymnasium in his honor on that mm -hmm. day. And these are things you can find all this information out on our church website at phgbc.org, phgbc.org. With that, we're going to say good night, love all of you, and we'll see you next time.